good morning, Calvary. As we are really packed, if you could scoot in, there's a few people still coming in looking need places to sit. That would be great. I would appreciate that. We are excited that you are here today in the, this cold and wintry, well, it's actually warm today, right? For January, it's like all the way up to 28. Who's excited about that? Yeah? Spring is coming. I promise it is coming. We're talking about the idea of identity um, this month and, and the identity of who we are made to be. And if you weren't here last week, I think it's really important before we get into today that we talk about last week and set it up, okay? So last week, I'm going to jump right in. Is that okay, by the way? Glad you're here. If you're a visitor, welcome. Thanks for being here. But turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, as we talk about last week and this whole idea of identity. And, and this whole series is based off this one verse, where it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. This idea of imitating, it is the idea of mimicking, it is the idea of taking on more like God. You know that God asks us to mimic him? How cool is that? To, to look at ourselves in the mirror and, and to say, okay, I want to see more of Jesus. In fact, that was the challenge we presented last week. We said, if you want to have a good 2015 year, right? then I want you to be able to look yourself in the mirror today. And then I want you to be able to look yourself in the mirror at the end of this year and see something different. I want you to see more of Jesus when you look in the mirror at the end of the year. And so how do we do that? We, we challenge you to, to pray this prayer. Lord, here are my hands and my feet. Help me to show someone else who you are. Here, my hands and my feet help me to show someone else who you are. And why that prayer is so essential is with this idea, there's two really main commandments in the Bible. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, your obligation is to fall madly in love with God. And as you fall in love with God, then you are to realize that this should change you and you should want to take that out and share it with other people, not seeing yourself as more important than they are. And so we challenged ourselves and asked ourselves, so what does this look like? How is, as a follower, we call ourselves followers who make followers who make followers of Jesus around here. As a follower of Jesus, what should this look like? And we came with this verse found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Submitting to one another. This is the place where we say, okay, I'm going to yield my best interest for the sake of others. And we said, what would it look like if our church practiced this, right? Your best interests are more important than mine. What would it look like if, if we, we did this in our marriage and in our work and in our life? And so this week, we're going to start breaking down those examples. And we're going to talk about it in view of marriage. Now, I know not everybody in this room is married. Some are too young. We don't want you to be married at nine. So, some are divorced, and I, and I want you to know this message can still pertain to you. Some are um, widowed and widowers, and some are just, you're married, but you're not married, and it's a harsh place for you right now. And, and I want you to know wherever you are, I think God can still speak to you in this message, but I want to talk about the marriage relationship because I think it most closely relates our, to our relationship with God. So in this passage, God uses marriage as an example. And then he says, this is how you should mirror and mimic your relationship with me as it does in your relationship with your spouse. So let's dive right in and get controversial right away. <laughs> um, and look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And we're going to start back and read verse 21, even though we just read it, because it's important in the context as we talk to the wives first. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. This is kind of a hard passage for me to read. First of all, I want to say wives submit. It doesn't say women submit. You get that, right? It doesn't say women submit to all men everywhere. It says wives submit to your husbands. And when I read this passage, I, I, I make myself go, okay, 
Our culture doesn't exactly say that this is popular, but if we are to immerse ourselves in the word of God and say, God, your will be done, and we're going to say whatever your word says we will do, then what does this passage say? And it says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. He is the savior of your body. Now submit wives in everything. I don't really know what to do with this. First of all, Growing up in the world, I, I heard the, the church would say one thing about marriage and then the world would say another. And so I wrestle with this idea because the, the, the two biggest insults you could say to me growing up were to call me a racist or a sexist. I was not one of those things. And, and even if I was, I wasn't going to, I, I, don't call me a racist or sexist. Of my generation, that is the, the biggest insult you can say. Don't call me those things. And so when I look at this passage and I started listening to a bunch of sermons, you know what you find? You have a huge, wide, wide gap of opinions as to what this passage actually means. But here's what I know this passage says. It says, wives, submit to your husbands in everything. So what do we do? Well, we go back to the week before where it says, right, Submit to one another. And so we understand that husbands are to submit to their wives at some level, but it says the wives should be the head of the home, basically, in this passage. So in order to tackle this passage, don't worry, ladies, it's harder on the men, I promise. We're going to get there. In order to tackle this passage, let's first talk about what this idea of submission means, and let's talk about it from what it doesn't mean, okay? Submission does not mean checking your brain at the door. It doesn't. In other words, it's okay to laugh. If y'all want to laugh some of this, it actually makes me feel a lot better. We're going to embrace the awkwardness and just laugh together. Submission means checking, does not mean, oh, almost it does. It does not mean checking your brain at the door. My, my wife and I discuss everything. My wife is intelligent. My wife is smart. My wife is super, super independent. You know, and I love that about her. And, and we discuss everything. So ladies, it does not mean to check your brain at the door. It does not mean, I want to be very careful in this. It does not mean that we are opening a door for abuse. If abuse happens, ladies, I, and some men in this day and age, I don't think God wants you to be in an abusive relationship. Seek help. There is no place in this world for physical violence or emotional abuse. And I'm not talking, he burned toast, I don't like him anymore kind of thing. I'm talking deep emotional abuse and physical abuse. It does not say that you have to yield and do that. So if you're in an abusive relationship, I beg of you, seek help. We as the church want to walk beside you. It does not mean always saying, whatever you want, dear, right? Where are we going on vacation? Wherever you want, dear. What do you want for dinner? Whatever you want, dear. And this reminds me of the, the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Anybody, you know? And the wives who typically practice the whatever you want, dear, the, I know I'm dating myself, but this movie describes this, you know, the, the wife sits around and she goes, oh, well, we really believe that the husband is the head, but the wife, she's the neck. And you watch that head turn without the neck, you know, the neck turns the head wherever she wants it to go, right? <laughs> That's not what this is talking about either, right? But it's not playing this passive game. Oh, you know, I, I can't think, I can't talk, and, and what, I have no opinions. No, have opinions. That's not what it's saying at all. And lastly, submission is not slavery. I want to talk to the men for just a second. To the men in the room, when you say to your wives, if you are married, you need to submit to me, you are no longer allowing her to submit because then you're basically saying, you have to do it. Submission is a voluntary action by definition. It is a willful choice. And you know what, husbands, you don't get to do is you don't get to say, you have to. You don't get to say that. So ladies, really, this idea of submission is on you. Will you submit? Will you yield? Will you put his interest before your own? And, and I'm going to get real personal with you, okay? One of the biggest problems we have in marriage is women sometimes put, and occasionally men, but often women put, once children are in the, the relationship, they put the needs of their children before their husbands. Ladies, don't do that. That's not biblical. 
You should always have your husband as your first priority, and that's hard, but it should be. Husbands, do not elbow them or you will be in trouble. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now because we're about to get to you, okay? But before we do, I, I wanna talk uh, the next part a little bit about, so why? If, if submission is a choice, if, if submission is voluntary and God asks for women to submit to men as whatever this idea of the head of the household means, why? Well, this is where you get a myriad of things. You get a, a big understanding of commentaries. And, and, but let me just tell you some of the things that people say, and all these things sound good, but I don't really think that's the point of the matter of what this passage is truly about. Okay, so there's gonna be some validity to the statements here, but let's just read it like this, okay? One of the typical answers that people give is that women should submit to men because women and men think differently, and therefore you should submit. Okay, first of all, I'll admit to you that women and men think differently. Do, can we at least, most of us agree that women and men think differently? Yeah, we, we can, right? You know how I know that? My wife will go out with her friends and I'll go out with my friends and she'll come back and, and she'll say, what did you talk about? And they talked about relationships and we talked about basketball. And she was like, didn't you talk about something important? And I said, we did, we talked about basketball, you know? Important, yeah, that a boy. You're not married, but I like that you contributed to this thing. And so this idea of, yeah, we talked about basketball. I hope you're not married, you're way young. But anyways, this, so this, this, we think differently. We think differently. Yeah, if, you, if you have little kids, you see the difference, right? Here's an example. Uh, if, if you have little boys, and let's say you don't bring guns in your house. We, I, I'm, not a, I'm not against guns at all, but I know I'm the guy that would shoot myself, right? And so we never bought our boys guns. They just were given to them by their police uncles. Thank you, uncles, if you're listening to this, which you won't, but thank you so much. And, and, but what I discovered through the years is my boys would take a grilled cheese sandwich and turn it into a gun. Grilled cheese. <laughs> hey, dad, look, it's a grid. It's good. Legos became grenades. If you give them Barbie dolls, anybody ever given a little boy a Barbie doll? They'll, they might nurture it. And listen, if your boys play with dolls, great. They need to learn the nurturing fact too. They might do that for a while. And then they might pop up one leg, hold down the other leg and use it as a gun. <laughs> because men and women just think differently from the time we are born. And, and we have to acknowledge that God made you male or he made you female. We think different. So that's okay, but I don't think that's the reason that God says for women to submit, okay? So the, the second thing, another poor excuse is um, sometimes people say, well, we are better at different things. Okay, we are somewhat better at different things. You know how I know that? Go down to the nursery. I, I don't know if you really, oh, yeah, I don't know if you, if, if you realize this, but if you, and I'm just gonna throw this out there, and if you don't like it, send an angry email to toaks at calvarybc.net, but... <laughs> If you were to go down to the nursery and you were visiting this church and you were to drop your baby off in, I mean, brand new baby in the nursery and there were three men there, you know what a lot, about probably half the people would do is, thanks, we're gonna take our baby with us. <laughs> why? You know why. It, it, it's, okay, when I brought home my boys from the hospital, you know what I realized? I don't know what I'm doing. And she may not have known what she was doing, but she knew a whole lot more than I knew what I was doing. Why? Because she gathered with her friends and talked about mothering. I gathered with my friends and we talked about basketball. <laughs> and so there are things that, that women are better at and there are things that men are better at. And that's where we get awkward because anytime you say those things, people go, uh, -uh right? But can we just concede that if there are things that women are better at, that there are probably some things that men are better at, like getting things off top shelves. Can we at least say that one? Okay, yeah, just a few, all right? Shaving our faces, we're probably better at, you know, could we do it? And so this, this idea that there are things, there are a lot of things that men and women can do pretty equal. And, and hear me, if you are working, I'm all for equal pay. And I, I think that, that the society has gone a lot in a, in a great direction at treating women with dignity and respect, but we're still different. And one of the things that I would, I would urge, you, urge you to say is be careful if you say, I think men and women are equal. You don't really mean that because if we were equal, we'd have to have the same body parts because equal means the same. What you really mean is we should be treated with 
equality. We should have the same dignity. We should be treated with respect and value. And I'm all for that. But men and women are different. But is that the reason he asks us to do this stuff? I don't really think that is. So let's keep going. What's another reason? Uh, Another reason that sometimes people say that that God wants women to submit and men to be the leaders is because psychology supports it. Okay? There is some psychology there. Let let me show it to you like this. Okay? If if a man and a woman are um, holding each other, they're married and they're holding each other, right? Okay. Very rare in my life have I gone to my wife and laid my head on her chest and said, would you put your arms around me and hold me? Matter of fact, I don't know that I've ever done that. <laughs> I'm feeling weak. Would you hold me? You know? But, but it's kind of natural for her to do that to me. Matter of fact, they say that one of the most romantic things that a man can do to a woman is kiss her on the forehead. Why? Because it is that, that idea of protection. It is that psychology suggests that there is, there is a difference there, right? There is this, this understanding, right? And, but the, there is psychological differences. There are things that we look for in a man and a woman, but I don't even think that's what it's about. So what is, why does God ask women to submit? Well, we're going to get back to that later. So let's pick on the men. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Men, I want to remind you, it says, submit to one another, then we're going to read this part as part of your obligation too. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless in the same way husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church since we are members of his body. Wives, you get one task. It says submit to your husbands. Men, you get to submit and provide, first one, unconditional love. That's the duh one, right? Duh. Why does he say husbands love your wives? Do you realize in that day and age, husbands didn't necessarily love their wives. In fact, women were property, viewed it almost as property, and they were arranged marriages, and you'd bring them home, and you would use them to cook your meals, and you would use them for other things, and you would, they would just be there to be used. And, and God elevated it. God always elevating the value of humanity. Have you ever noticed that? And so he looks down, and he says, husbands, love your wives. You know what else I've noticed in, in when you're a pastor, you do sometimes marriage counseling, and Reggie can verify this. But I've noticed through the years something that a professor had in college. His name was Dr. Pepper. True. It told me. He said this. He said, husbands will be the thermostat, and wives will be the thermometer in love. Husbands, you will set the temperature for your marriage relationship, for the love part. As you show and give love, your wife will be the measuring stick by which everyone knows that your marriage is full of love or not. So if husbands, you lead the way in showing affection, in showing love, in showing, dare I say, intimacy, your wife will respond. Here's the problem. Do you know what a marriage intimacy is really made of? It's really made of three parts. It's made of physical intimacy, uh, spiritual intimacy, and emotional intimacy. You could argue intellectual intimacy, and I would go with it, but for the sake of convenience today, we're going to talk about those three. Physical intimacy, uh, spiritual intimacy, and emotional intimacy. Here's what happens. I'm about to do premarital counseling and marriage counseling for a whole room of people, and you're going to be like, this makes sense, okay? Here's what happens. Most men want and desire primarily... Yeah, this wasn't rocket science, people. Physical intimacy. <laughs> Good. I, I like the interaction. Interact. Physical intimacy, right? Most women desire primarily emotional intimacy. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate their participation. You did much better. <laughs> Shocking, right? Um, so what ends up happening? Couple comes into my office, sits down, and, and here's the complaint. She's not meeting me physically, and I feel physically drained. 
intimacy wise. I'm, there's kids in the room. You understand what I'm saying, right? Okay. And she sits there and goes, well, I don't feel like being physically intimate with him because he's not emotionally there for me. I don't feel like being emotionally there for her because she's not physically there for me. Maybe you should submit to one another and see what happens. Because see, when you bring this spiritual intimacy and you pursue the idea of God and says, my best interest is your best interest, what ends up happening is he sits there and goes, I want to emotionally be there for you. And all of a sudden she starts going, oh, you look more attractive. <laughs> I'm not making this up, people. And then he sits there and he goes, he goes, uh, uh, she, or she sits there and she goes, okay, he's not emotionally there for me. And so she, she tries to be physically there for him. And you know what happens? The, the psychology and, and the um, biology of it all says that, that when a man receives physical intimacy at that moment in his brain, it triggers all this stuff and makes him more emotionally connected with his wife at that moment than he will be at any other time. Do you get it? As we go and, men, you set the standard. How do you express your love or do you wait for her to do it all? Unconditional love. The second thing he challenges there is he gave himself up for her. This is the idea of sacrifice and protect. You know what, if someone breaks in the house, I'm not waiting for my wife to go, don't worry, Daniel, you stay in bed, I got this. She grabs the baseball bat out from under the bed and goes, ah, you know? No, I, I would do this. And, and I joke and all the time, and, and hear me, I, I have a great marriage with my wife, but let me just tell you, we've been married for 15 years now, and, and, and this is, I just try to be as vulnerable and transparent with you as possible. It's been 13 of the best years of my life. Because there are days when marriage is hard. There are moments where we don't see eye to eye, but in that time, in that one constant, I know she has never, ever doubted that I would die for her. I would. I would die for my boys. You, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be a second thought. It wouldn't be a momentary glance. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be, oh, let me think about it. I gotta pray. Oh God, should I die for her? No, <laughs> I'm dropping on that grenade. I'm jumping in front of that bullet. Whatever it takes, I'm going to lay down my life for her because it's in me. Because husbands, you are to protect your wife. As she feels safe and secure in that, guess what? She'll feel more emotionally connected to you. And that's a good thing. It, it trickles down. So here's my challenge to you. You understand that as you do these things, it, it benefits her, which ultimately benefits you. But here's the trick in all this. You can't benefit the other person with a secret intention of trying to get it back. You have to just genuinely give even if they don't give back. That is submission. The other is a game. The third thing it says for the men to do, wash her with the word. Cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. Now, this is confusing. And, you know, if I read like 20 commentaries, I got probably 23 different answers of what this passage means. That little sentence, washing her with the word. And, and when you look at this, it really, I think, centers down into this idea and this understanding of what the word, word means. What the word, word, what the word, word, okay? What the word means, word. And the word, word in John 1 says, in the beginning was the word of God and the word was flesh and dwelt amongst us. So Jesus was the word of God. And Psalms 139 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and to light into my path. So it's the scriptures. But here's what I really think the word of God is. And, and when you wash her with the word, it means this. The word of God is any time that God himself is revealed. We call the Bible the word of God because it is an errant. Now, when I preach, I'm not saying I'm an errant, which is why you need to go back to your Bible. I could make mistakes, but I believe the Bible is an errant and you should go to that and you should study it. And when you, when you become more and more understanding of what the word of God is, as, you, as I preach, if I'm preaching correctly, I'm spending the word, I'm spreading the word over you. What we need to understand is when the word of God is shared, it takes people to Jesus. Husbands, Take her to Jesus. Simple. Studies show this. 
Studies show this over and over and over and over again. And I know, listen to me, to the to ladies in this room especially, and I know there's some men as well, whose spouse won't come to church. We are praying for you. And I'll talk to you about that again in a little bit. But for those of you in this room, I would, I would beg of you men, lead. Lead in showing your family Jesus. When you wash the word, when you speak the word, the, the, the fathers who bring their kids to church almost never have their kids walk away from church. The fathers who pray with their wives almost never get divorced. The statistics are astounding. If you pray daily with your spouse, you will hardly ever get divorced. And so it's this idea of will you pursue God together? Husbands, love your wives, protecting her and washing her with the word of God while submitting to her will. That's a lot. Let me tell you something else. And I think this is, this is just as transparent as I can be. We're in a day and age where it's hard to identify what it means to be a man and a woman. When you first get married, you, you spend the first year. If you're anybody in the room about to get married, you're, you're gonna spend the first year, two years, trying to identify what is a husband and what is a wife in your context. I told you earlier, the, the two biggest insults you could call me growing up were to call me a racist or to call me a sexist, okay? That shaped who I was as I was growing up. And what I started to notice is it's shaping a lot of other men in our society. 2012, I did a survey. I was a college minister and I did a, a national survey of college students and I asked them this question. What does it mean to be a man? Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, that they didn't really have a clue. And that's a problem when we look at our men in our world today and we, we look at our boys who are growing up and shaving. You could be a 30-year-old boy who shaves. You know, that doesn't make you a man. Age does not make you a man. So what makes a man? There, in fact, the, the, this was supported by a, a study done by Brown University, not exactly a Christian university, right? That said, our society has a bunch of boys who are growing up who, don't know, who no longer know what it means to be a man. In an absence of not knowing what it, they should grow up and to be, they're becoming nothing, and it would be better for them to have something that is a poor idea of what it means to be a man, for them to have a goal and achieve something than to sit on a couch all day playing video games. They have to become something. So the question then I, I wanted to ask the students is, what does it mean to be a man? So I asked them and I surveyed women and men and I asked them, what does it mean to be a man? And, and a third of the responses were, being a man equals body parts. Whoa, succeeded. I don't think that's what it means to be a man. What does it mean to be a man? And then another huge percentage was honest and said, I don't know. Over half the people responded with either body parts or I don't know. But this was a religious survey. So let me just tell you, another huge percentage, the biggest percentage answered this question with, like, with this answer. What does it mean to be a man? They said, a man should be a leader. Great. What does that look like? Their response I don't know. You see, a leader is a church response that we've taught our boys. You should grow up and be a leader. You should be a leader of your home, but they don't want to be sexist and they don't want to be a jerk. And they, they want, I don't know what it, I don't know how to do that. They just tell me to be a leader. And so I'm just assuming one day I'll, I'll figure it out. Here I am. And a very small percentage of the men answered they had an understanding. As a matter of fact, it was the smallest area. A strange thing happened. We surveyed the women the same question. You know what they didn't largely answer as a man as? Body parts. <laughs> and they didn't largely answer that, that, that men were leaders, but they had a very good description of what they wanted men to be. And so you saw this answer and you saw the answers of strength, confidence, protection, but the overarching main answer that they gave, that the women who are age 18 to 25 said that they wanted and they wanted in a man was this one word. They wanted a man to be responsible. You see what's happening a lot of times in this day and age, and hear me, there's nothing wrong with this. With women working full time, women know how to handle little kids usually better. Men put all their identity in being a protector and a provider. 
Well, in this day and age, you don't really have to do those things. And so they've lost a sense of their identity. And what these women were saying, listen, I don't even care if I make more money than you. That doesn't bother me, but do your part. I don't care if I work harder than you, but do your part. And men are going, I, I, I don't know how to be responsible and, and not have any say. And so what it says is, what, what all that they're saying is, when, what men need to be is to accept their responsibility, to stand up and protect and work hard in your family, in the home, out of the home, wherever, so that your wife isn't sitting there doing all the work because the reason you don't have identity is because you're not trying. You're sitting on your tail wondering, what's my role? You know what men want more than anything else in this world? And it's not the word that begins with an S. <laughs> you laugh, but I'm serious, okay? It's respect. It's respect. Men, you will not get respect sitting on your couch playing video games. <laughs> you might when you're 10. But when you're 30, play video games for 30 minutes, put it down. Go out and pick up a paintbrush. Or, I don't know, do something. <laughs> do a load of laundry. Mop. It is manly to mop. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Work. Do something. Don't just sit around being lazy. Accept your responsibility in your house. And it is your responsibility to show your family Christ. If you come to church... More often than not, your family will come. If your kids come to church, more often than not, your kids will come. Accept that responsibility. Now, in your marriage context, what does that look like? In your marriage context, what does that look like? What does it look like if, if your uh, spouse isn't a believer? Well, look with me real quick in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. This works both ways. It's written to wives, but it works both ways. In the same way, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband so that even if some disobey the Christian marriage, they may be won over with a message by the way their wives live when they observe your pure and reverent lives. Ladies and a few gentlemen in the room whose spouse is not a believer, I want to say I'm sorry. And we hurt for you and we as a church want you to know that we pray for you. Stay on the course. Following God is worth everything. Pray until your last breath in your life for them. Don't give up on them. Live for them. Now, once again, I'm not talking about an abusive type situation, but pray for them and continue to live pointing them to Jesus. To those in the room who are believers, what I would say to you is this. Husbands, you are to love and set the standard of love in your house. Your wife will reflect whether or not you're doing it good or bad. You are to protect. You are, she should know you would take a bullet for her. And you are to point your, her and your family to Jesus. That's your job. Wives, you are to submit. So I didn't tell you earlier what it actually means to submit. So here's my definition of submission, okay, ladies? My definition of submission is in seeking after Christ, look at your husband with grace-filled respect. With grace-filled respect. The main thing men want is respect, right? Right? So what's the opposite of respect? The opposite of respect is that nasty word that begins with an N and ends with an ag. Some of you will get it in a minute. And so here's the old adage, you know, like if, if you want him to paint a room, you don't go, you worthless piece of trash, get up off your video game couch and go paint the room. He's going to go, I don't want to. But if you go, you know, you're actually really good at painting and that wall over there, I probably couldn't paint. He's going to go, what just happened? I'm here. <laughs> which might be a form of manipulation. So don't do that at all, you know? But once again, you can't do these things to get something else, but, but offer ladies, if, I can't tell you how this will shape your marriage. 
if you will offer your husband grace-filled respect, because here's what I hear so often. I hear women crying and agonizing over the fact that their husbands aren't living for the Lord. And I say, just show him respect, grace-filled respect. He's supposed to live like Jesus, but guess what? He's not Jesus. And so you sit there and go, I will show him the respect he deserves when he starts living like Jesus. Well, aren't you glad Jesus didn't do that to you? You see, Jesus loves you in your misery and your shame and your failings and your shortcomings and your, your faults, both men and women. He looks down at you and he says, I love you unconditionally. And he died on the cross for you. So with grace in your eyes, knowing that he will never be what you want him to be, would you show him respect? Unmerited, unconditional respect. You know what happens when we start doing these things? Notice we didn't talk about roles. That's for you to work out in a marriage. We talked about this idea of, of really saying, okay, ladies, you're going to allow him to set the thermostat, right? And show him respect. But men, let me just tell you, you better step up and do it. I can say that because I'm a man. I wouldn't be that harsh to women. It's time. It's time to do this. What ends up happening is we show each other Christ. Look at me as we close. As Craig's going to come on up. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, it says this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself and a wife is to respect her husband. You see, this parallels the relationship we have with Christ and the church. And as we do this, as we work on our marriages, and as we look in the mirror, not only by ourselves, but maybe with our spouse by ourselves, and we say, at the end of the year, I want my marriage to be stronger today than it was this year. Even if my marriage is going great, the way it happens is by seeking Christ first. Submit to one another, practices everything that the church should do. Marriage is not the exception. So as you submit to one another and you say, okay, what I'm going to do is point my family to Christ. I'm going to point my spouse to Christ, whether a woman or a man, it doesn't really matter. As Christ is glorified and Christ is exalted, we become what the definition of a marriage should be. So here's the definition of what a marriage should be. The purpose of marriage is to join together in showing each other the, and the world Christ in light of eternity. See, far too often what we do is we look at our marriages as what can I get out of it? And that is the surest death nail on the coffin of your marriage. But when you look at it in light of eternity, the fact that God wants to use you and your marriage to point other people to Christ. He wants to point your children to Christ if God blesses you with children. He wants you to point your neighbors to Christ. He wants you to show the world that you can actually live in harmony with another person and not kill each other that God is good and that grace abounds and that yes, my husband and my wife has faults, but we live in light of the grace that God has given us. And we're going to share this with the world because we live our marriage in light of eternity. This is when your life changes. So where's your marriage? If you're married, is it in the dust? I got good news for you. God can make beautiful things out of the dust. So I don't know where you are right now, but I know the better days can lie ahead as long as you look yourself in the mirror and you say, God, here are my hands and here are my feet. In my marriage, in my singleness, through my divorce, through my brokenness, God, you love me. So here are my hands and my feet. May I seek you and then show the rest of the world more of you the redeeming grace of Jesus. Let him take you and make something beautiful out of you. Father, we don't begin to deserve your love, but you love us anyways. God, and in light of eternity, you sent your son down to die for us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this time. For just a moment, I'm going to do this. If, if you are single in this room, 
or your, your spouse is not with us today, would you just take a moment and pray for those who are hurting? Would you pray that they would find their identity not in a status, but in Christ? And encourage and pray for those whose spouses aren't believers and pray for yourself that you would be drawn more to God. To those of you who are married in this room for just a few moments, as Craig strums for just another minute, husbands, would you just gently reach out and grab your wife's hand? And would you just pray silently over her? Would you pray together as a couple that God would take your marriage and make it stronger and lift each other up as you seek after God now? Take just a moment and do that.